All right. All right. So, uh, so basically what I was saying and giving my testimony. So we were, we, my wife and I were uh, at this rescue mission and the, uh, the director's daughter came up to us and told us that we were going to be publishing children's books. Okay, and I want to read this to you because I want to make sure that I uh, give it to you. Uh, it said, we both, okay, no, uh, okay. During the drive back home, we discussed this prophecy, my wife and I. We both concluded this prophecy was way off because we were in social services, in the social services business at the time, not publishing. See, I do own a publishing company, but not at this time. Not when this lady did the, the prophecy. We've always had a social service business since 2002. So we were already in business, but you know, and I, I had written books, but my books were still being uh, published by other publishers and stuff like that. And having my own publishing company was nowhere in the picture at this time. However, Five years later, after helping a friend, five years later now, after helping a friend get his book published, I started my own publishing company. Okay, now follow this. Eight years after starting our publishing company, eight years now, we published our first children's book in 2018. Fourteen years after it was prophesied. Now, what's interesting about this story is, I didn't know the director's daughter had a prophetic gift. We, were at, we weren't at some prophetic conference, in some prophetic line with people slinging uh, uh, anointing oil and prophesying and speaking in tongues and knocking people out and they flipping around on the floor like a fish. This wasn't that. We were in a rescue. I had just preached. And before we took our sit, she just walked up to me and prophesied. So when my wife and I got in the car, <laughs> we looked at each other and said, man, baby, she missed it on that one. <laughs> And I, we didn't think anything, I didn't think anything else about that prophecy. She didn't, and, 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 and the thing is, the lady didn't call herself a prophetess. That's not her title. She, she was just a Christian, the, the director's daughter, okay? We were not even in a church. We were at a rescue mission. No prophet at conference, none of that. This was spontaneous and unexpected, but God directed. Both my wife and I will be the first to admit we did not take her word seriously because the prophecy seemed baseless. It wasn't until I was uploading the elements of the children's book in 2018 that God brought it back to my remembrance of that prophet's word, of that prophetic word we received 14 years earlier. And I call, I recently spoke with the woman and told her that the prophecy was fulfilled. She was just as amazed as I was. Now here's the amazing thing. Now, being a publisher, I have a manufacturer and all that. So I'm finishing up this children's book. I'm not even thinking about no prophecy. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm telling you, my mind was, because you have to pay attention to uploading these files. You got to know what you're doing, right? So I'm uploading the files to the manufacturer. Then it was the spirit that brought it back to my memory. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit can do this. He's the one who brought it back. I wasn't thinking about it. The spirit brought it back. And that woman's words, that you guys were going to be publishing children's books. And we published a, a, a couple of them. That, that's not our main forte, but that we, we published a children's book. And there it was. I 
said, oh my God. Because when it came to pass, ladies and gentlemen, it's like God confirmed it in my spirit. He didn't let it go. He brought it back to my remembrance to let me know that was not some spontaneous utterance from somebody's heart. That was legitimate. Now, you can be one of these evangelicals who say God doesn't talk to people. If that's your testimony, that's fine. I get it. I get it. If you say God has never spoken to you in your life, I believe you. But you cannot tell me God has never spoken to me because God has been great in my life and my wife's life. And we know how he has worked with us. And I'm not changing my testimony to, 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 to hobnob with somebody who believes the opposite to affirm their theology. I'm not about to do that. Glory to God. This happened to me and my wife. Prophecy is probably the most intriguing among the various forms of biblical literature. As a whole, prophecy should be should not be viewed miracle, uh, merely as a collection of predictions of gloom and doom or God's displeasure and anger with his people in the world. But its messages are encouraging, strengthening, and filled with blessing and hope. Listen, when God can fulfill things in your life that he has spoken to you, it confirms and builds and strengthens your relationship with God to trust him for the next thing and to keep on trusting him. He gives you these little spiritual signposts along the way, your journey to heaven. Glory to God. However, in giving these messages, the purpose and the plan of God and the character and personality of the prophet become enmeshed. Even though it's a God's message, it's the prophet the prophet's person in which people see and interact. That's what you got to remember. You're not seeing God say this. You're seeing that prophet say it. Whether he's strange looking like John the Baptist who lived outside, wore camel's hair, ate wild locusts. Just imagine how grotesque that looks to us today. A person living out in the wilderness that eats grasshoppers. Is that a person you would invite to your church to come prophesy or preach? What would John the Baptist smell like? I wonder what he looked like. He lived outside. But nobody, everybody knew he had power, though. They didn't want to mess with him. Glory to God. There's some very strange things in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. It's through the prophet's character, emotions, disposition, and experience in which God's prophetic word must come through. Therefore, there, just as a tree is known by the fruit, a prophet is also known by his prophetic messages. Though people may not accept the message or the messenger, they recognize that a legitimate prophet speaks on the behalf of the Lord. Since prophets are God's mouthpiece, this also put the prophet in a precarious situation with people. In the following passage, here's what God told Jeremiah. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsel and stubbornness of their own evil hearts and went backward, not forward. From the day your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worsen their fathers. They did, they did worse than their fathers. 
So you speak to all these words. So you speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. Now God is saying, listen, Jeremiah, I want you to go tell these people this message, but I'm telling you now, they're not going to listen. Well, like God, well, why send me over there to do this? Like, like this is a mission of futility, right? <laughs> but God is saying, no, you got to tell them because I told you to tell them. I want them to hear it, but I'm just telling they are going to reject you. <laughs> but guess what? In doing so, guess who they're really rejecting? Me. And I'm going to get them. Prophets had the formidable task of delivering a word from the Lord that in many cases was particularly unfavorable to a stiff necked people. Prophets were often shunned, rejected, and even killed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a far cry from the prophets of today. People did not want to see no prophet because they had a word from the Lord and it often was not good because the people were living outside of the will of God. So God didn't come down there talking about blessing, blessing, blessing. No, God is about to say, look, I'm going to bring the Babylonians if you don't straighten up. Who wanted to hear that? Nobody wanted to hear Jeremiah talking about the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And, and uh, 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 oh, who? Oh, come on, Jeremiah. God is not going to send them wild heathen Babylonians to destroy this beautiful temple. The temple of the Lord. Look at the temple, man. Come on. God wouldn't let nobody do that. Jeremiah going, you, you know what? Y'all better repent or none of you. This temple will be destroyed. God don't care about this. You think people wanted to hear that message? Nobody wants to hear a prophetic message. Not a real one. People do not want to hear that. People don't listen. People say, we want to know the mind of God. A lot of times, no, you don't. Because it means you getting squashed. You better be, we, we are all benefactors of God's mercy and grace. You do not want to be on the wrong side of his holiness. Y'all, don't you know that God is a consuming fire? You have any idea what Christ did for you on the cross to stand before him and answer for yourself? Though ultimately it was, it was God and his message that the people were, were, people were rejecting, it was the prophets, God's messenger, that caught the brunt of the people's complaining anger. Calling out people's wickedness is death. Dangerous business. Ask John the Baptist. Got his head cut off because he told Herod he was wrong about sleeping with his brother's wife. Decrying the falling and corrupt political system and the priesthood could get the prophet killed. In the Gospels, Jesus lamented this very fact when he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? Glory to God. This passage gives a glimpse at the heart of God who only wanted to save and protect and bless his people that he loves so much. But instead of heeding God's voice, they vented their anger. They vented their anger at the prophet. Their hostile actions toward the prophet was manifested, was a manifestation of the wickedness of their hearts that were opposed to God's righteous rule. In Jeremiah 7, 25, God gave Jeremiah some historical insight to Israel's rejection of himself when he made the reference to the Exodus. Well, God tested Israel for their 40, during their 40 year journey through the wilderness to the promised land. One would think after 400 years of slavery, finally being delivered by a barrage of miraculous events that broke the Egyptians back, that Israel would want God to communicate directly to them. However, that was not the case. 
In Exodus, we find the children of Israel said to Moses, remember, <laughs> I brought this out early. He says, speak to us yourself and we will listen. Glory to God. He says, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak for, to us for we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of, the, of God will keep you from sinning. See, see, <laughs> he was saying, listen, y'all don't have to be afraid of the voice of God. What's happening is he's doing this to test you, to keep you from sinning. He don't want you to sin. Why? Because he want to bless you, but he's not going to bless you if you're out of order, if you're out of whack, if you're out of position for his favor. But they didn't want to hear from God. They were too scared of him. Glory to God. There are a few reasons why this passage is important. The first reason is because the people did not want God to talk to them directly because they were terrified. <laughs> from the very beginning, Adam and Eve became afraid of God after they had fallen into sin. Sin has always been the issue between God and man, ladies and gentlemen. That's the barrier right there. Not only did sin separate us from God, it also made us afraid of him. Because sin carries guilt and the fear of judgment. This is why Adam and Eve hid themselves when the Lord called out to them in the garden. Moses attempted to appeal to the people by reasoning with them. In a sense, he was saying, come on, come on, don't be afraid of the Lord. He's putting the fear of God in you so you won't keep sinning. Not sinning was the only way God's favor and blessing would abide on Israel. Again, sin is the problem. Isaiah so passionately appeals to God's people when he says, but your iniquities have separated you, uh, uh, you from your God and your sins has hidden, hidden his face from here so that he will not hear. So ladies and gentlemen, now we're understanding the purpose behind a prophetic message. We have so far removed ourselves from this reality that the whole purpose of the prophetic message is so people would be in right relationship with God so he could bless them. That's what he wanted to always do was to bless them. But if you are going to act ignorant and be out of the way and be arrogant, disobedient and, 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 and lie to my face, do everything wicked thing under the sun that I said, do not do, then what I have to do to keep from squashing you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send someone to you with my perspective on what you're doing. Then that way, of course, if you get my perspective, you would turn around and do the right thing, right, wrong. Human beings have never done that. That's why we need to save you. We are all messed up, ladies and gentlemen. We are hopelessly damaged by sin, hopelessly. This is what was meant uh, in the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity. Not that we were the worst person we could be, but that every part of us is tainted by sin. Glory to God. It is sin that has always kept, has been a barrier between uh, the blessings of God. Where there is no sin, there is no unfettered fellowship and access to God. The ultimate expression is that is that when we're going to be in heaven, where God himself will dwell with his people. This is how it was in the beginning when we would see God, when we would see God in the cool of the day coming to fellowship with heaven. However, after sinning, Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of God. Why? Because they had sinned. That's what did it. Once sin entered the picture, the dynamics of the relationship between God and man changed drastically. The fact that man was now separated from God, God's presence altered every aspect of God's relationship with man. Now that man was irreversibly tainted by sin, the only way for people to approach God was by the way of a blood sacrifice, subsequently creating the need for a priest and a priesthood. 
Again, since we had separation had occurred, where communication and fellowship with God were severed, this eventually created the need for the prophet. You see this? That's why the prophet is there, because God and you are separate. How he does it is through a mediatorial office called a prophet, so he'll speak to you. Glory to God. Glory to God. When there is direct access to God, a prophet is no, a prophet is no longer necessary. Once we are all in heaven, prophecy has ceased. We don't need prophecy. If you're right there with God, talk to him directly. But what, 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 what is it about us now that won't be when we're in heaven? We have new bodies, no sin, no nothing, unfettered access to God. Who needs a prophet? Who needs church? Who needs a temple? All of that. Glory to God. During the church age, the Holy Spirit is given to indwell believers, to sanctify and empower them, to lead and guide them in all truth. This was not the current case prior to Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Spirit rested upon God's people to empower them for service. There's a, even though there is a reference to the uh, uh, Spirit of Christ being in the Old Testament prophets. The first Peter does say that now. But in general, the Holy Spirit operated differently. But now we are his temple. The spirit takes up residency as he perfects our holiness. How effective his sanctifying process depends on a Christian's maturity, knowledge in the Lord and submission to God's will. A Christian that attends a good church with a pastor that is walking in the will of the Lord does not need to consult with anyone who carries the title prophet. <laughs> Let me, you know what? I need to say that again. A Christian that attends a good church with a pastor that is walking in the will of the Lord does not need to consult with someone who carries the title prophet because your pastor will fulfill that role because he's going to be the one in that body that speaks thus saith the Lord. Understanding the purpose for the prophet helps us to better understand the purpose behind the prophetic message that always originates from God's frame of reference and given according to his righteousness and holiness. The God who knows all things, feels all time and space, has all power and is very desirous for his people to be in relationship with him so that his people can experience the blessing of having God's goodness and mercy abide upon them. Therefore, God is very concerned about anything that would impede the flow of his favor and grace to his people. Since God cannot tolerate sin, wickedness, the number one impediment of God's blessing and favor, he sends his prophet with a message to rebuke, of a message of rebuke and repentance to the world and nation and king to the masses or individuals so that repentance reconciliation and restoration can occur prophecies that are of human origin do not have heaven's perspective and they cannot discern the secrets of men's heart they are limited to a message that entices people about materialism wealth and brings no conviction of sin. True prophecy originates from the heart and the minds of a sagacious God who knows perfectly the hearts of men, all things, all things of the world, all not, and all knowledge of the future. God's message would have men to align with his righteous kingdom. Therefore, the prophetic message that is that is divine conflicts with the desires of a wicked human heart, and that that is, attuned, that is attuned to the things of this world. This is why the prophetic message is typically so burdensome and brings tension and persecution to the prophet bearing God's message. So you have to, you have to understand. 
Okay? In Jeremiah 23, 29, God spoke these words. Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? God's word is like a hammer because that's what it took to break up the hardness of people's stony heart that refused to heed Jehovah's message to repent. Indeed, they would rather be deceived by appeasing messages of false prophets rather than to address their sin. Again, Jeremiah says, this is what he says in Lamentations. I want you to remember this scripture, ladies and gentlemen. It's very important. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. It says, your prophets, your prophets have predicted for you falsehood and delusions and foolish things. They have not exposed your iniquity and guilt to avert your captivity by causing you to repent. They have divined and declared to you false and deceptive prophecies, worthless and misleading. Now we're going to study this out. This, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is something else what the Lord just said here. Glory to God. So, I want to make sure that we get this. Lamentations 2.14. We're going to read this from a few versions. The visions, this is coming from the NIV, the visions of your prophets were false and worthless. They did not expose your sin to ward off captivity. The prophets they gave you were false and misleading. And see, what is God saying here? He's saying, look, if it had been a true prophet, I would have called your sins out so you could repent then that way I wouldn't have had to send the Babylonians. That's what this is saying. I wouldn't have had to do it. He said, but the prophets that you gathered to you, it's your ears, folks. They gave you false and worthless prophecies that did not go to the heart of the matter, which is to expose your sin. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians? If a, if a stranger walked in and you reveal the secrets of his heart, in other words, expose his sin, then he'll say, man, how they know that? No, the power of God is here. I'm, I'm going to give my life up. I surrender. Throw them hands up. So this is why, ladies and gentlemen, it is so vitally important that we understand the true prophetic message. Now we're going to look at Micaiah the prophet. Micaiah in the second in uh, the twenty second chapter of First Kings, we find a very interesting account that gives us more insight into the message of a true prophet. After approximately three years of peace between Israel and Syria, the king Ahab had conceived the idea of recapturing Ramoth Gilead from the Syrians. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, expressed a willingness to help and Ahab's and, and, and uh, help Ahab in his military campaign. However, Jehoshaphat suggested that before going into battle, Ahab should seek the Lord through a prophet. In keeping with Jehoshaphat's advice. Ahab sought the counsel from 400 prophets of his own court. In other words, he went to the, he had itching ears. He went to the false prophets that was going to tell him what he wanted to hear. <laughs> it is interesting that the false prophets appear in large numbers. <laughs> it's a bunch of them. That's why the Lord said there to be many of those, a whole bunch of those. The real ones, they're not, you don't need that whole bunch of them. This is typical of human reasoning that puts trust in numbers and show of force. 
If you get enough people saying the same thing, it will quickly be accepted as the truth because it comes from the majority opinion. We, we have that going on in our, our political discourse right now. Even even evangelical Christians going along with lies, majority opinion, because they didn't hurt a lot long enough. Glory to God. Happens on the other side too, the same thing with, 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 with the right. I mean, with the left. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care. Listen, the bird is sick. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference whether it's left wing or right wing. They attach to the same sick bird. The sick bird is the eagle. America is sick. So if it's left wing or right wing, they both are out of the way. Both of them got issues. That's why I don't call myself a Democrat or a Republican. Don't call me. Don't even try to call me nothing. Glory to God. Because all of y'all, all of us are out of the way. All these prophets advised in favor of Ahab's idea said, Go! They answered, For the Lord will give, uh, give it to the king's hand. However, Jehoshaphat wasn't buying it. <laughs> Clearly, Jehoshaphat knew that Ahab's prophets were false prophets and could not be trusted. So he asked if there were a prophet of the Lord that they could consult. <laughs> Ahab said, man, I ain't listen. I ain't fighting nobody's battle listening to them. <laughs> these, these people's calling psychic hotline, looking at Ouija boards and uh, consulting astrological signs and reading tea leaves and all that. He said, man, I ain't about to go to no battlefield listening to what they predict. He said, no, oh, you better get me a real prophet. Glory to God. So this brought up Micaiah, a true prophet, a true and courageous prophet of the Lord. But Ahab, Ahab hated him. Ahab, Ahab knew about Micaiah, but he didn't like him. Here's why. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not yet a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? And the, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, only one, not 400, by whom we may inquire the Lord, but I hate him because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. <laughs> see, wicked people see God prophesying truth to them as wicked or evil because they're the ones that's out of the way. So the man didn't want, he said, yeah, he knew Micaiah was a true prophet, but he didn't like Micaiah because Micaiah would be calling him and, and, and Jezebel sin out. So of course he didn't want to hear from him. So he hated him. He said he don't never prophesy nothing good concerning me, but evil. That's because you evil. What, if, <laughs> what good can I say about your evil but? <laughs> I'm telling the truth. The Lord is saying, thus say the Lord, the Lord, Lord, everything you do. Ahab, you and that old wicked wife Jezebel. Yeah, both of y'all got a destiny that's going to come true on y'all here in a minute. <laughs> he said, he is Michael, the son of uh, Amla. But Jehoshaphat had said, let not the king say so. In other words, Je Jehoshaphat, uh, Jehoshaphat said, man, don't be calling God's prophet a uh, bad. This is the one you need to be listening to. You take advice from the wrong people, you're going to end up in trouble. Glory to God. <laughs> oh, boy. Unlike his 400 false prophets, whose agenda was to appease the king with lying prophecies, Micah's prophecy came from the Lord and were correct about his wickedness. Truthfully speaking, a wicked person can only receive an unfavorable prophecy. Okay. A tr truthfully speaking, a wicked person can only receive unfavorable prophecy from a righteous prophet because the true prophecy would deal with their sin. See, people don't like it when you call out their sin. So you done stepped on their toes now, so now they ain't trying to hear you. Ahab hated Micah because Ahab and Je Jezebel were wicked rulers. The ungodly particularly despise the message of a true prophet because they are always out of the will of God. It is never God's agenda to appease people with pacifying prophecies, but rather, but rather to bring people to repentance for his righteousness sake. So now, do you come in peace? 
Listen to this. Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 4. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him and asked, do you come in peace? Now, why would they treat Samuel like that? Because, ladies and gentlemen, people didn't want to hear from a prophet. Because the prophet gives God's perspective on things. God's perspective is completely different than our perspective. He is righteous. We are unrighteous. Glory to God. So when a prophet came, he was usually bringing <laughs> judgment and all kinds of stuff from the Lord because they out of order. So instead of some rolling out the carpet, oh, here comes the prophet, man, get the red carpet. Oh, we want to see this guy. Ooh, can't wait to hear him preach. Oh, boy, boy girl, you got to go. Man, you got to go. Line up, get there early. Let's hear the. That is not what they did. They seen him. The elders came out and met him at the gate. Say, man, before you even come up in here, do you come in peace? <laughs> That's a little different. In these prophetic conferences today where a zillion and five people try to get up in there just to hear some stupid prophetic word so they could get their ears tickled. Glory to God. This passage gives insight to how people respond to the prophet. No prompt. He didn't get, man. Samuel didn't get no prompt in circumstance, no red carpet, no trumpets, no nothing. They met him at the gate and said, man, what did you, is you coming up here with a good message of uh, damnation? <laughs> Conversely, no one wants to be around a prophet that hears from, from the Lord and will call out a person seated from the pulpit to the pews. Churches far and few in between will welcome a prophet that can reveal the things the spirit searches, even the deep things of the heart. They didn't want to hear that. Glory to God. And I'm just about getting ready to close this chapter. I'm trying to see how much more I have. Ooh. Still have quite a bit here. We're going to end this last segment. Ladies and gentlemen. But God knows the plans he has for you. In Jeremiah 29, the Lord makes this passionate statement. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord's plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. How many times have we heard that passage preached? A zillion and five. I've preached it. Many people have preached it. And we use it as a uh, prophecy of encouragement. Okay? All right, now. Listen. However, the context of this passage finds Judah captive in Babylon for their national sins of backsliding. It's when he was in there for 70 years. In approximately 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar besieged and destroyed Jerusalem, something that was long prophesied by Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, etc. However, Judah refused to heed God's prophetic warning and judgment came. That judgment would come if they did not repent. Now, in Jeremiah 29, exile and captivity. In Jeremiah 29, exile, exile and captivity had already occurred. Therefore, Jeremiah wrote a letter to those who were now captive in Babylon, telling them to settle down, plant vineyards, let your sons and daughter marry and be productive, because they were going to be there for a long time, 70 years to be exact. Though the circumstances that they were in were, were in was because of the Lord's national chastisement, in the midst of captivity, God was yet giving them hope. Okay, so now why were they there? They were there because God was punishing Israel. All right, number one. So basically, he basically told them, when the Babylonians come, go back with them. Don't stay here in Jerusalem or you're going to die. You need to go to Babylon because I'm the one who's bringing these people to abuse y'all and to put y'all in captivity. Okay, that's what's going to happen. All right. And Jehovah's passionate appeal to his people. He assures them that he knows the plans for his people. 
This is the point that cannot be overemphasized. God is the planner. He is the one with the plans, not us. God knows, controls the future. We don't. Therefore, it is God who communicates his plans through his prophet. In this message, God reviews, re reveals the future intentions will to prosper you and give you a hope in the future. But it requires right standing with God. And in verses 12 and 13, the Lord goes on to say, he said, then you will call on me. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from captivity. Since it is God who is the blesser and knows all things, and knows the path that people would take. Therefore, he knows all the danger. And uh, 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 um, he knows all the danger of the bad decisions you're making. To prevent us from making shipwreck, he sends a prophetic word of correction so we can change direction. God would not have sent Judah into captivity had they repented. The Babylonian captivity was in response to Judas's, Judah's, Judah's callous heart. One of the most loving acts that God can do is to forewarn us of consequences to come if we refuse to change. And all this we are learning that one of the principal purposes for the prophetic message is so people can know the heart of God. He truly wants what's best for us. He so much wants to bless us, not to harm us. He has some wonderful plans to give you hope and a fulfilling future. The question is, is why won't people heed the prophetic message? Why don't people simply say, God just wants this for my good. So I'm gonna change, get it right, so God can bless me. The answer is, is because people have desperately wicked hearts. Jeremiah illuminates this, the depth of wickedness of the heart when he states, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know it means we cannot comprehend the depth of our own wickedness. From our own perspective, we're just fine. But David asks, who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Psalm 1912. Very, very poignant uh, a passage. Glory to God. Very impactful, rather, passage. Glory to God. Since we all have wicked hearts, our propensity, our proclivities are bent towards sins and the things that please the flesh. We live in flesh, so we, we're always trying to please it. It is through the desires of the flesh that we connect with the cares of this world. From where the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of pride of life permeate and dominate. First uh, John uh, two sixteen. Therefore, if our primary motivations in life are driven by the world, the flesh, and the devil, a prophetic message that implores people to come out from the ways of the world would be rejected. This is the reason that Jesus stated. No one can serve two masters. Either, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be, to be devoted one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. We're going to get into that. Glory to God. People serving wealth. Glory to God. And because they serve wealth, a prophet that comes to talk about the obtaining of wealth is a more attractive message. This is why false prophets are so dangerous. Because what's happening is, is you are being subtly shifted into serving another God. Hmm. Money allows us to access and participate with the world offers. Having home, food, shelter, indeed, are indeed necessities that money, uh, uh, that take money to obtain. God does not have a problem with 
that in itself. But it is the love of money that is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6, 6.10. You never hear a prosperity preacher preaching from that. Glory to God. Never hear him do that. You never hear them uh, using the message of Laodicea. You say you are rich and have need of nothing, but you don't even realize you're blind, naked, and wretched. He said, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. I can't stand you. You taste bad to me because you say I'm rich and have need of nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, wealth without Christ is deadly. And that's why Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter heaven. If you're wealthy, if you have things, you better not trust in your money. You ought to be thanking God all the days and be benevolent and be a giver. Be a repository of, of, of resources to all those that have not. That's why God gave you that wealth. But that's another subject. Those who are of the world are seeking money first and all the things that it can buy. So that they may satisfy the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. These are the principles of the world, what the world is based on. But the prophetic message says, all that is in the world and the desires of the flesh, the desires of the, of the pride of life, are not from the Father, but it is from the world. Therefore, the world's message will always be sent Centered upon bigger, better, and a brighter. Oh, let me say this again. Therefore, the world's message will always be centered upon a bigger, a better, and a brighter you by doing it the world's way, not God's way. This is true even when the world's methods and message are packed and packaged in Christian terminology and imagery, even though done in the name of the Lord. We are warned, do not love the world or anything in it. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. So remember, when we are in Deuteronomy, he said, remember, if the false prophet comes to you with a message that has you serving another God, you should get away from him. This is the danger of false prophets today. They come in sheep's clothing. They teach all the Christian doctrine. But what they do is they teach you how to appease the flesh through the lust of the eye, the pride of life. Glory to God. Uh, uh, you know, and that's, that's what's in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That's how they come at you. Glory to God. So because that spirit is not of the world, and it increases in you the desire to become covetous, In Ephesians, the Bible says covetousness is idolatry. Idolatry means serving another God. So when false prophets come, they're not hearing from God. They do not have God's perspective. They can only give you the spirit of this world. And that's not of the Father. False prophets are are so dangerous because their message will lead you away from God to compromise and embrace the world with their lips. They prom but only with their lips they promote Christ. And this is why Jesus said, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching merely human rules. We are admonished. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye will be uh, able to test and prove what is God's will is. His good and pleasing, perfect will. God's will for you is good, pleasing, and perfect. Good for you from his righteous perspectives. Pleasing to him because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. And perfect because he has designed it specifically for you. 
All this is so you will not be seduced by the enticements of the world and pulled off course or be deceived by false prophecy that redirects your affections towards this world. You cannot serve two masters. And that's the problem with the wealth and the prosperity thing. You're in being induced and influenced to serve the world little at a time and you really don't even notice that you drip. It's like I used to be in the Navy, right? How ships navigated was through a compass. Glory to God. And the compass, you could get your direction. Glory to God. So if you're heading off on a course 090, that's your course that you got to go. And say, stay on that course for a thousand miles. Okay? And you'll get to your destination. So, what if you go 091? One degree. Well, you're going in a general direction. Same general direction. Same thing. But the further you get out, remember you got to go a thousand miles. One degree will take you hundreds of miles off course as you keep going. That one degree. One degree. You can't even perceive the one degree difference. And that's how it is with being seduced by the world. See, when you're seduced by wealth and material, now, there's nothing wrong with working, having a job or a successful business, and God has blessed you with material good for you to enjoy and to be a blessing for others to glorify God. Nothing wrong with that. We're talking about having wealth become the, the object of your affections to where now you're serving another master. And the false prophets come to give you those messages that'll pull you off course a little at a time. And some of them, it ain't a little at a time. Some of it, it's just blatant way off course. But folks go for it because they don't know the word of God. They reject him. The Lord addressed this very subject when instructing his disciples in Matthew 6, 24, that the Lord have already taught us, you cannot serve both God and money. Jesus goes on to say, the reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat and what you will drink, nor, nor for your body as to what will you, will you put on. Is not this life more than food? Some people act like all this, all this life is, is to go somewhere and eat. And the body more than for clothing? Do not, do not worry then, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear, what clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after these things. Now listen to this. What he's saying is unbelievers seek after these things. You know why? They don't have a relationship with God. And when you don't have a relationship with God, Gaining all the material world wealth makes the most sense. See, if you don't believe in God, having all the money, having all the gold, having all the houses, and, and, and doing it to you satisfy all the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that is the way to live to them because they don't know anything about God. They think that you live and then you die and that's it. That's what they believe. So since they believe that, ladies and gentlemen, since they believe that, that's what they're the most interested in, is gaining wealth. Because what else is there in life? If you don't have God, what else is there? You might as well get all the gold you can, make all the money you can, even though it's nothing. Well, what else is there? Because you don't have God. That's why people live hedonistic lives, trying to fulfill themselves, trying to have fun and enjoyment and all of this stuff. The pursuits that we spend our life change chasing, wasting valuable time. Chasing at the things that cannot bring you happiness. For the Gentiles seek all these things. Your heavenly father knows what you need, these things. 
He said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, the important thing is, ladies and gentlemen, these things will be added. But God knows how to add them and knows how to give it to you to where it doesn't ruin you. You know, one of the worst things that could happen in America is fame and success and wealth. More, a lot of famous people are retrobate, reprobate people because they have no happiness. They have the illusion of happiness. They're smiling for you in front of the camera, but at, li at night their lives are jacked up. They're sleeping with anything, don't know whether they're male or female. They're trying to get cheat, scandal, everything they can to get ahead just to get a golden statue or a Grammy Award or Oscar or a Tony. And these things cannot make you happy. They make Oscar Awards here in Chicago. It's a statue. But people kill, lie, and all of that. Just to get one of those. It's a corruptible crown, like Paul talked about. He said, these men race for a corruptible crown. He said, but I ain't beating the air. He said, I ain't trying to uh, run for no corruptible crown. I want a crown that's incorruptible. Glory to God. Here, yeah, Jesus is making a clear difference between the cares and the dictates of this world and the principles of the kingdom of God. They are diametrically opposed. For those who have no relationship with God, the most important thing in life is fulfilling the lust of the flesh through materialism, the pursuit of wealth, hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure. When an individual has no relationship with God, there is no expectation of eternity. Only their philosophy is simple. Eat, drink, marry, for tomorrow we die. Glory to God. Eat, drink, and be merry, rather, for tomorrow we die. When there is no expectation of judgment, then everybody does what's right in his own eyes. To this ideology, Jesus responded, for the cares of the Gentiles, non-believers eagerly seek these things. People who are motivated by money and materialism are not hearing from God. They're hearing from the world. It's two different messages. That's why I spent all the time in the other segment talking about the prophetic message. However, a true prophetic message would be God already knows what you need and is much in a much better position to supply your needs because he knows your beginning and your ending and has ordered your footsteps. Now, God would be the one who knows how to bless you. He ordered your footsteps. Now, wouldn't he know when to do don't you know God know COVID-19 was coming? He knew. Glory to God. He knows all things. He knows when to give you stuff and when not to give you stuff. Therefore, you should seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Remember, it's always going to be God's agenda to assure people are in the right standing with him. What he, he says that if you will see God with all your heart and hunger after his righteousness and turn from your wicked ways, he will add things that your hearts desire. It is actually folly to assume, to assume you need to inform God of your needs. <laughs> the God that bought you in this world, y'all, we act like he don't know what you need. He knows that better than you do. God can bless you to a degree that you won't be able to have room to receive it, but you must seek his kingdom and his righteousness. This is what the core of a prophetic message to God's people has always been, whether it's individually, nationally, or politically. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. He knows the plans he has for you to do good, not to harm you, but to bring you to a fulfilling future. Glory to God. In this last segment, we're going to do Come See a Man. Talking about the woman at the well. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have said well, I have no husband. 
for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you have truly spoken. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Ah, prophets know things. God can unction them to give something. Now, how many people these people are? And just because God said he told me to tell you something, that don't mean nothing by itself. But this is Christ. Listen, 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 listen to this. Once again, we have a clear example concerning the evidence of the prophetic message. But this time it's from Jesus. From the, from the vantage point of the times which Jesus lived, the Jews knew the signs of a true prophet. See, that, see, see the Jews knew the signs. That's why she was immediately able to tell you, you must be your prophet. Glory to God. Whether it was powerful, miraculous signs like raising the dead or having a word of knowledge to discern the purpose of life, the signs of the prophet were well known to the people. It was no different for this woman in, in Sychar, the town in Samaria. After encountering this unnamed woman at Jacob's well, Jesus demonstrated his love for the woman. woman he pri prioritized her spiritual needs over her physical needs. Asking her Asking her to call her husband was a setup to expose the sin in her life to introduce eternal life. Notice what he did. He didn't go say, look, you and your husband, or this you and your shack up, y'all about to get two golden donkeys and a and a and, and, and land and all of that. That ain't what Jesus did. Oh woman, you gonna find five denarii on the way home or some 30 gold coins or none of that went right to the heart of her issue. It is interesting to note that specifically the Lord's discernment. He told her how many husbands she had. He told her how many husbands she had and called out her out on the fact that she, the man she was living with was not her husband. The Lord was not vague by saying, <laughs> There are some things going on in your life. <laughs> there are some things. God is shifting some things. You know, they always say that. And listen, we're going to get into this, this false prophecy stuff. It is hilarious. But it's sad. But I mean, it's, it's funny. Now, notice what the Lord didn't say. And I'm just paraphrasing. The Lord was not vague by saying, there are some things going on in your life. Or you are having some issues with your relationships. <laughs> he didn't do that. He ain't come that way. No. The Lord was unmistakably specific. On the other hand, false prophets tend to be notoriously vague. More on this later. Neither did Jesus enter into a prognosticative dialogue about some fortune in this woman's near future. Something that the false prophets readily focus. But by prophesying specific truth, dealing directly with her sin, he established his office as a true prophet. And he was a prophet. He's a Messiah, but he's a prophet as well. And the Samaritan woman knew it. Jesus did not have to declare himself to be the prophet. Notice he didn't have to declare, he had to say nothing. True prophets do not go around with the title prophet. <laughs> they don't have to. They don't have to do that. They can open their mouth. After his prophet signed to her, she made the declaration herself. Today's prophets always have to declare themselves to be prophet. I'm gonna tell you, I'm a prophet before you knowing it. See, no, don't say it, prove it. She knew everything that he said about it was true. Only a true prophet could have possibly known how many she, how many husbands she had over the span of her life in Samaria. A place and people that the Jews detested. Glory to God. Glory, glory to God. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring this part of our, uh, our segment to a close. Um, we will begin our next series. 
this, well, let me read this because this is right before I start the next chapter. And the Lord said unto me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to speak. They are prophesying to you lying visions, worthless divination and deceit. We're going to get into this divination. We're going to get into that. Glory to God. What is that? Chapter two of my book. Chapter two, spinning the web of deception. Simon Magus. Simon Magus. In Acts chapter 8, he is called Simon the Sorcerer. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to turn the heat up in our coming segments. And we're getting into the, all the false stuff. You're going to learn about it. Learn how to recognize it. Know here's what the Bible says about it. This is why you have to know and continue with the study. God bless you. If you would like to reach out to us, you can uh, uh, mail us at Power of the Holy Ghost Deliverance Ministries. And the post office box is 1239. Mattison, M-A-T-T-E-S-O-N, Illinois, 60443. Any uh, comments or anything, attention, uh, Dennis Woods. If you want to make a donation, do not give it. Do not make it to me. Make it to my ministry, uh, the ministry that God has given us. I, I, I hate to even say mine. God gave me the name for my ministry. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. The, 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 there's three things God spoke to me. Well, the, I'm going to tell you about three things. When I was living in Harvey in the 1980s, I was living with a four family called the McCoys. They had taken me in. God spoke to me and gave me the name of my ministry, Power of the Holy Ghost Deliverance Ministries. Put it right in my spirit. And it had always been with me. I remember I told a, a bishop that one time and he told me, he said, don't, he said, don't tell nobody that name. He said, God gave that to you. You know, you, 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 you don't want nobody else to get it and all that, you know. But years later, ladies and gentlemen, that was in the 80s. Years later, that's what we named our ministry, our 501c3 ministry, we organized in the year 2000. So we've been going 22 years. We've been on the radio and all that ever since. God gave me the name for that in like 1988. 1988. The business that my wife and I share is called Couples Mentoring Youth and Family Service. God spoke that name to me. My publishing company is named Life to Legacy. God spoke that name to me. All of my bis my two businesses and my ministry were God breathed into my spirit and they have been flourishing ever since. Now, I don't, I don't know where you stand on prophetic utterances and all of that. You could be at one extreme, everything that comes out of somebody's mouth who call themselves as prophet is from God. Or you could be on the opposite extreme and say, God don't talk to nobody today. Well, if it's your testimony, God has never spoken to you, I believe you. It's not my testimony and I'm not going back on it. Jesus has led my wife and I and so many other people through a small, still voice in the Holy Spirit as we mature and learn to walk with the Lord, we talk to him in prayer every day. Why talk to a God who can't talk back? Why pray to a God who can't answer? Glory to God, I'm going to leave you with that. Listen, we'll see you the next time. It has been a blast in Jesus' name. God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name.